Hello, and welcome to Step-by-Step -step PC Assembly. On this tape, you'll learn how you can easily assemble your own IBM AT-compatible computer. Based on Intel's industry standard 8286 or 8386 microprocessor chips, these are commonly referred to as 286 or 386 based computers. And you can do it for a fraction of the cost of the equivalent system from IBM. I assure you that you won't need to know anything about electronics. You won't need to do any wiring or soldering. The only tools you'll need are a small Phillips screwdriver, a small blade screwdriver, and a pair of needle nose pliers. It only takes a couple of hours to mount the components in the chassis and connect the cables. This tape is designed not only to teach you how to build your own computer, but also to introduce you to all the components that go into that computer and to eliminate the mystery about what's inside. So that if later you want to make an addition or change, you won't have any fear of doing so. It will come very easily. The computer that we're going to build today will have one megabyte, or one million, characters of memory installed directly on the main board. It will have two diskette drives and one hard disk, and it will also have a monochrome monitor and monitor card. Before we begin assembly, we'll explore each of the components necessary to put this system together. The first component we'll cover will be the case kit. The case is made up of two major components, the cover and the chassis. Cases come in several types. One is the slide off type as we have here. The cover simply slides off to expose the chassis. This case is also referred to as a full sized AT case and is designed for standard size 286 and 386 motherboards and standard AT compatible power supplies. This case can also accommodate the smaller sized motherboards. The cases are also available which have a smaller footprint and are designed to use the mini or baby motherboards and smaller power supplies. Most of these mini cases limit expansion by reducing the number of drives that can be installed. Another type of case is the tower case. This case stands upright on the floor freeing up desk space by leaving only the monitor and the keyboard on the desk. The other components that are provided with the case assembly are four rubber feet for the bottom of the chassis, card edge guides to support the front portion of any full length expansion cards that have been installed in the computer, and slot cover plates to cover the openings of any unused expansion slots at the back portion of the case. Also included are disk drive mounting rails and brackets, plastic blank face plates for covering any unused drive bays, and a package of screws to assemble the various components. A speaker and front control panel are also a part of the case assembly. The control panel has a lock to disable the keyboard, a turbo button to toggle the computer between its two speeds, a reset button which will restart or reboot the system, a power on light which remains illuminated when the computer is turned on, a turbo light which will be on while the computer is operating in its fast or turbo mode, and finally a disk activity light which indicates activity on the hard disk drive. The next component we'll cover will be the power supply. This is a 200 watt power supply which is the minimum I would recommend for this type of system. It will power the motherboard and four additional devices such as floppy disk drives, hard disk drives, tape backup devices and so on. Also when selecting the power supply make sure that the physical size matches that of the case kit you have selected. Next are the diskette drives. This system will have two diskette drives. This is what is known as a high density five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive, which can store up to 1.2 million characters of information on each floppy disk. The five and a quarter inch drives also come in lower density 360 KB versions made popular by the early IBM PC. The second diskette drive is a three and a half inch high density drive which can store up to 1.44 million characters of information per diskette. Again, a lower density version of the three and a half inch drive is available, storing up to 720 KB. Next is the monitor. 
This particular monitor is a 12 inch monochrome TTL monitor. This monitor provides very sharp resolution for text and number type applications such as word processing, database, spreadsheets, accounting, and so forth. Next up is the monochrome monitor card. This card connects to the motherboard through its expansion slots. We will cover how these are actually installed a little later in this tape. This particular card is a half-length 8-bit expansion card that drives the monochrome monitor as well as having a parallel printer port adapter. It also supports monochrome graphics known as the Hercules standard. The next expansion card is the disk controller card which will connect up to two diskette drives and up to two hard disk drives to our computer. This is a 16-bit card and will support any combination of two of the four types of diskette drives we discussed just a few moments ago. Then we have the hard disk drive itself. This particular hard disk is a 40 megabyte half height hard disk with an average access time of 28 milliseconds to retrieve data from anywhere on the hard disk. This is the type most commonly found in an AT class computer. The last item we'll cover before we begin assembly is the motherboard itself. Across the back of the motherboard you will notice the eight expansion slots. These slots are used to insert expansion cards to control various devices such as the one we showed you earlier, the monitor card and the disk controller card. Internal modem cards, controllers for tape drives, a number of device controllers can be attached via these expansion slots. That's one of the unique features of the IBM style of personal computer, its open architecture. Each one can be configured to its owner's needs. There are two types of expansion slots, 16-bit and 8-bit. The 8-bit slots are the two shorter slots with only one connector, as is shown here on the monitor card. The six longer slots with two connectors each are 16-bit slots and can accept both 8-bit and 16-bit cards, such as the 16-bit disk controller card. At the front and to the outside of the motherboard, you will see four neat rows of chips. These are the memory chips, referred to as RAM. These four rows are divided into two banks of two rows each, numbered bank 0 and bank 1. Each bank must be fully populated with 18 chips. While this particular board allows only the 256 kilobit chips in bank 0, on many boards, bank 0 can accommodate either 256 kilobit or the higher capacity 1 megabit chips. The minimum amount of RAM which can be installed is 512 kilobytes, or 512K, and must be installed in bank 0. To get 512K, we would use 18 of the 256 kilobit chips. If we were to use the 1 megabit chips, we would still have to use 18 chips in bank 0, so we would end up with 2 megabytes of RAM. The second bank, or bank 1, can be populated with 64 kilobit or 256 kilobit chips, and on many boards, 1 megabit chips can be used in bank 1. If we have 256 kilobit chips installed in bank 0 and 64 kilobit chips installed in bank 1, the resulting RAM size would be 640K. If we have 256 kilobit chips installed in both banks 0 and 1, the total RAM size would be 1 megabyte. On boards that allow the use of 1 megabit chips, if we have 1 megabit chips installed in bank 0, we can only use 1 megabit chips in bank 1, which would give us a whopping 4 megabytes of RAM. And at the very front of the board, just in front of the memory chips, we have the connectors for the speaker, the reset switch, the turbo LED, and the keyboard lock and power LED. Going to the center of the motherboard, you'll note the square chip sitting next to an empty socket. This is the central processing unit, or CPU chip, that we talked about earlier. It could be either a 286 or 386 chip. The empty socket next to the CPU socket is a space for what's known as a math coprocessor, which is an additional processing unit for use in very high-speed calculations. It's an Intel 8287 chip that would be installed in this socket. 
This is an optional chip that you can add if you are going to be doing heavy spreadsheet type calculations, computer aided drafting or design, desktop publishing, or heavy graphics. In the upper right hand corner of the motherboard we see the power connectors where the motherboard receives its power from the power supply. At the very back of the board we have the keyboard connector. Just below the keyboard connector is the onboard battery and the connectors for an external battery such as this one. Just below the power connector is a set of jumper pins to define which type of monitor, monochrome or color, you are going to install on your system. We will talk about how to set this jumper a little later. Before we begin assembling our computer, I would like to point out a few differences between the 286 motherboard and the 386 boards. For the most part, everything we've discussed so far applies to both the 286 and the 386 motherboards. In fact, from an assembly point of view, there's little difference between the two. The layout of the RAM banks is different. We still have two banks, 0 and 1, but each bank requires 36 chips to be fully populated rather than 18. There is no support for the low capacity 64 kilobit chip and you can't mix two 56 kilobit chips on the high, with the high capacity 1 megabit chips on the same board. So if bank 0 contains two 56 kilobit chips then only two 56 kilobit chips may be used in bank 1. And if you have used one megabit chips in bank zero, then you must use one megabit chips in bank one. Through these combinations, we can have RAM sizes of one, two, four, or eight megabytes. Also found on 386 boards is a 32-bit expansion slot for an optional eight megabyte RAM card, making an enormous total of RAM size of 16 megabytes available. The 386 board also presents options for two different types of math coprocessor chips. Here we have a socket where we can install an Intel 8287 math coprocessor or we can use either the Intel 8387 or Ytech 1167 math coprocessor in this socket. 